For more than 300,000 years, the Neanderthals and Denisovans inhabited large portions of Europe and Asia. They left behind a trail of genetic clues that have fascinated modern scientists. The Neanderthals are one of our closest extinct human relatives. Among the many physical characteristics that have been investigated, the presence of red hair in certain Neanderthal populations has piqued researchers' interest and offered fresh perspectives on the genetic diversity of these individuals. When we trace the long and tangled history of the human form, we are forced to confront again and again the dual influence of heredity and environment. It is not merely bone and brain that mark the record of mankind's march through the ages, but the very pigment of his skin, the hues of his hair, and the shield of melanin wrapped about him. In this regard, the melanocortin-1 receptor, known as MC1R, emerges as a locus of profound evolutionary consequence. It is not without reason that anthropologists, anatomists, and now the molecular biologists have come to regard this tiny sequence of DNA with such reverence. Located at the terminus of chromosome 16, it is through MC1R that the ancestral condition of dark skin, brown eyes and black hair was conserved across the sun-drenched plains of Africa. And it is through mutation and relaxation of selective pressure in far latitudes that the pallor of the European, the freckled Celtic complexion and the ginger mane of the Northern Islander arose, as well as the light skin of East Asians. If we are to understand the divergence of ancient lineages, Neanderthal, Denisovan and Sapiens, then the history of this gene is indispensable. Let us begin at the root of the matter. In the earliest days of the genus Homo, as the tropic sun bore down without mercy upon the equatorial belt of Africa, nature selected for those individuals whose skin could withstand the withering effects of ultraviolet radiation. Melanin, and particularly its darker variant eumelanin, was selected not merely for its photoprotective properties, but for its preservation of the essential vitamin folate, which sunlight destroys. In those early hominins, be they Homo erectus, Homo ergaster, or the still mysterious forms who left their footprints in the mud of Letoli, the MC1R receptor functioned with high fidelity, producing ample eumelanin and conferring dark skin as a default. This condition, preserved across hundreds of millennia, remained the birthright of mankind until his exodus from Africa. There is no reason to believe that either Homo heidelbergensis or his cold-weather descendants, the Neanderthals, initially differed in this regard. Indeed, the sequencing of MC1R from the Altai Neanderthal, recovered from the frozen ground of the Denisova cave in Siberia and dated to over 100,000 years before our era, reveals a receptor still equipped to manufacture dark pigment. But just as evolution preserves, so too does it tinker. In those lonely glacial lands stretching from Spain to the Urals, isolated from their African kin, the Neanderthal folk underwent a series of unique mutations to their MC1R gene. It is here that our tale begins to take on both intrigue and speculation, fertile ground for any anatomical inquirer. Two specific variants of MC1R stand out in the Neanderthal corpus, the first known as Val 92 Met, a substitution of methionine for valine at position 92, has been recovered in the Altai Neanderthal, marking it as the earliest known MC1R mutation in any hominin. Modern geneticists, whose tools far exceed our own scalpels and calipers, have determined that this particular variant reduces the activity of the receptor, resulting in lighter pigmentation. This is most curious, for it implies that already by 200,000 years ago, Neanderthals were beginning to break the African pigment mold. Not only did they retain the ancestral eumelanin-producing form, but also possessed a second haplotype, likely resulting in intermediate to light skin. The fact that this same Val 92 metallele is today found in modern East Asian populations, especially among the Taiwanese aboriginals, hints at ancient interbreeding events. In the mountains of Taiwan, where the old Austronesian voices still rise in song, a fragment of the Ice Age survives, not in the stone but in the skin. The freckled shoulder of a child, the undertone of amber in her hair, whisper of a time before cities, before boats, before memory, the Neanderthal is not gone. He lives quietly in the dermis of the aboriginal Taiwanese, in the echo of Val 92 Met, an ember from a fire that never quite went out. Imagine a freckled girl in the highlands of Taiwan. Her people have lived in the mountains for millennia, singing in Austronesian tongues, weaving myths of sea and stone. 
but in her skin, in the shadow of a sunspot across her cheek, is a whisper of Neanderthal Eurasia, a gene that survived when so many others didn't. In fact, 40,000-year-old Tianyuan Man stands on the threshold of what would become Asia, a ghost between continents. He is not father or founder, but cousin, his genome a branch that never blossomed fully. And yet in the highlands of Taiwan, in the freckled skin of the Atayal and the old Austronesian bloodlines, there is something faint, something ancient, a shared rhythm in the DNA. They are not his children, but they are of his kind, the same fire scattered in different winds. Tantalizingly, members of the Cheyenne tribe of North America also have high levels of this gene, second only to the Aboriginal Taiwanese. How did this gene survive in this population while the gene is absent in other Native American populations? Even South American groups, which have some Australasian ancestry, lack this mutation, although they also have high levels of Denisovan and Neanderthal ancestry. More provocative still is the second mutation, found not in the eastern Neanderthals of Siberia, but in their western brethren, those who inhabited Spain and Italy toward the end of their tenure. This variant, ARG 307 Glee, has not been detected in any modern human and seems to have been lost entirely with the extinction of its hosts. Yet, when introduced into human cells in laboratory conditions, its effects are dramatic. It cripples the receptor's function, halting the production of eumelanin and giving rise to pigmentation traits akin to red hair and very pale skin. The image this conjures, a red-haired Neanderthal amidst the snows of Ice Age Europe, would have once seemed fanciful, but we must allow the evidence to guide us, even when it contradicts our assumptions. Indeed, we must never dismiss a hypothesis merely because it offends our aesthetic instincts. Here, in the MC1R gene, we glimpse an ancient, perhaps adaptive, lightening of skin tone, a reaction to the low UV environments of the far north. Now let us turn to our own species, Homo sapiens, whose journey out of Africa brought them into lands already occupied by these pale cousins. The earliest sapiens carried, without exception, the ancestral MC1R allele. The ancient man of Ust Ishim in Siberia, who lived around 45,000 years ago, bore the same functional receptor, indicating dark skin and likely black hair, even as they hunted mammoth and sheltered under Paleolithic stars. It is not until after 40,000 years ago, in the heart of Ice Age Europe, that we begin to observe a cascade of MC1R mutations, this time not Neanderthal in origin, but wholly our own. Three unique mutations, all of which substantially reduce MC1R function, appear to have arisen independently and spread rapidly among European populations. These mutations, one by one, bled the eumelanin from the skin, yielding the familiar palate of modern Europe, the flaxen-haired child of the Baltic, the freckled Celt, the pale-skinned Scandinavian. And yet, for all their cosmetic effect, these changes were no accident of vanity, but likely a biological necessity. The weak sun of northern Europe demands a skin capable of synthesizing vitamin D with utmost efficiency, a task made easier when pigmentation is reduced. What then of the interaction between these two pigmentary lineages, Neanderthal and Sapiens? When we now look upon a man from the Northern Isles, his skin dusted with freckles and hair the color of copper, we may ask, are his features a gift of mutation or the legacy of interspecies union? In truth, both, for the Val-92 metallele found in the Altai Neanderthal did not vanish with their bones. Rather, it entered the sapiens genome through archaic admixture, that silent, fateful series of unions that occurred as modern humans spread into Neanderthal territory. Today, Val-92 met is found at frequencies as high as 30% in East Asian populations, and it remains associated with lighter skin and even freckling in some groups. Curiously, the red hair causing ARG-307 Gly variant has not survived. Though once present in the Neanderthals of Europe, it failed to enter the gene pool of our own species. Perhaps the line that carried it perished before contact. Perhaps it was incompatible with the human genome or perhaps it was selected against in warmer post-glacial climates. We may never know. Still, the phenomenon is clear. Some Neanderthal pigmentation traits entered our genome, while others did not. The boundaries between species, so zealously defended by Dr. Chris Stringer, grow blurred in the light of this new molecular evidence. It seems that interbreeding, not isolation, was the rule. It is a most Neanderthal idea that they, so long deemed brutish and extinct, should live on in our freckles and pale limbs. 
As a student of anatomy and a chronicler of the fossil record, we have long been inclined to the belief that man is not a fixed type, but a collection of variations, some recent, some ancient, some born of pressure, others of chance. The MC1R gene exemplifies this principle in fine form. It is but one locus among many, and yet it has shaped the appearance, the health, and perhaps even the identity of countless human populations. In the Middle Ages, a red-haired individual might be accused of sorcery. In the modern age, he may be celebrated for his rareness. But both judgments miss the deeper point, that this trait was likely born not in our own species, but in the Neanderthal, that ghostly cousin who watched the aurora flicker above the mammoth steppe. The mutability of MC1R and the selective pressures that have acted upon it testify to a central truth, that evolution is not a ladder, but a mosaic. The light skins of Northern Europe are not a sign of superiority, nor the dark skins of Africa a mark of primitivity. Both are adaptive solutions to the environments our ancestors found themselves in. In the hands of nature, the gene is but clay. In the harsh furnace of climate and migration, it is fired into form. As we contemplate the future of our species, it is perhaps fitting that we look to the past encoded within our genomes. For there, in the base pairs of MC1R, lies the story not only of pigmentation, but of interconnection. Between Neanderthal and sapiens, between mutation and adaptation, between inheritance and survival. We are, in the end, Neanderthal in part, not only in the bone, but in the skin. And in this I find no cause for shame, but rather a profound continuity. For every freckle, every shade of auburn, every pale cheek kissed by northern frost, is a reminder that our story is not singular, but shared. Let those who claim otherwise read not only the bones, but the genes.